everyone, welcome to another big Magical Girl video where I talk about shows you've probably never heard of. I do have a Chinese Magical Girl video in the works, I haven't forgotten about it, don't worry. But I wanted to yet again come back to Japan and discuss something that isn't anime. Tokusatsu is a term used for Japanese live action series and movies that have a great deal of special effects. Think Super Sentai, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, which I will talk, talk about, about one day, day I, I promise, promise. I, I love, love that, that series. series. Kamen Rider, or for this video, the Girls Heroine series. The Girls Heroine series is a series about magical girls who also have some sort of profession and their idols in the real world. Later on, some of the main girls not only make cameos in later seasons, but some are in big idol groups tied to the series. Like Girls Girls, or Girls Squared, and Lucky Lucky, or Lucky Squared. Yeah, every group attached to this franchise is called like Miracle Miracle, Magical Magical. They repeat the word twice, and they just, you know, square it because square root. Wrong. I think, I don't know math. You know how it works, I think that's super cute. I will be discussing each season in chronological order. So up first is Miracle Tunes. <laughs> Idol Warrior Miracle Tunes is the first season in the series and is directed by Takashi Miike, who worked on Ultraman Max and a lot of seemingly violent works. He was also a voice actor in the Animal Crossing movie. This, this man's, man's career, career is more interesting, interesting than my than life, life will ever be. There's only three main writers for this first season. Hisako Fujihira stayed with the franchise for two seasons and doesn't have any credits I recognize. The second writer is Kana Matsui, who has written for the first three seasons of the franchise. The last writer is Mao Aoki, who also stayed with the franchise for a few seasons too. But I can't find much info on them besides the first three seasons of the Girls Heroine series and some random movie. Miracle Tunes is about a group of girls who are both idols and idol warriors who have to collect the sound jewels in order to save people and protect music from the Doku Doku Dun. And the Demon King. This guy's kind of cute. <laughs> Our main character is Canon. Canon is your typical bubbly lead who dreams of being an idol. She goes to an idol audition to perform alongside popular idol Mai. Little does she know that it's actually a test to see who has the potential to become a Miracle Tune. Of course, Canon does, and she becomes a Miracle Tune. Side note, look how cute her transformation is. She is absolutely precious. In the next episode, an amazing dancer named Fuka is selected alongside Canon to be part of Mai's new idol group. Despite her cold demeanor, Fuka is thrilled. Until she learns about the whole saving others thing. Honestly, mood. But she changes her mind once she realizes she can save the people she really cares about. Like the teacher that encouraged Fuka to audition in the first place. After the trio is formed, we get to experience the girls' adventures in school, idol training, live performances, and collecting sound jewels. Pretty normal stories for this kind of show, but things change with the introduction of the popular sister unit Kari Kari. This new rivalry creates tension in Miracle Miracle, as their popularity is directly connected with their ability to collect sound jewels. What should be a dramatic story arc ends up being just a few tension-filled episodes that end with Akari and Hikari joining our heroes in Miracle Miracle. I wish this was a little more dramatic than it is, 
This whole rival turned partners thing could have been stellar, but it's very rushed. I don't want to say it's bad, but this part of the story could have used a few more episodes because after this, it's back to the same old stuff. School, idol training, friendship, collecting sound jewels, and it's a lot more fun than I'm making it sound. The fights are creative, the friendship of the five main girls is endearing, and the music is extremely catchy. I also loved when episodes would bring up the girls' families, like Fuka's parents being doctors in Africa who can't see her as much as they'd like. There is some good stuff here, but I just wish the pacing was a bit different. Anyway, we don't get any big changes again until episode 28, when the Doku Doku Dan are driven away by a more powerful enemy. Until they come back again, but honestly, this hardly changes the show. The only new concern is that the girls can no longer contact the Goddess of Music through the magic mirror. Other than that, cute fights, cuter songs, and occasional emotional episodes about the girls' personal struggles. All of Miracle Miracle's hard work pays off towards the end of the series, as they're selected to be Japan's representatives in the World Idol Battle. All the while, the Doku Doku Dan and the Demon King make their final attempts at stealing all of the world's music. Or whatever they're doing. I'm too distracted by these fun sets. They're so cool! As Miracle Miracle gets ready to perform at their biggest venue yet, you can see that they're competing against some... interesting looking competition. I appreciate the attempt at diversity, but it just feels... off. The Doku Doku Dan interrupts their performance, leading to a big final fight that's very well done. Cannon watches her best friends lose their will to fight. However, she soon finds a glimmer of hope and gathers the strength to not only save her friends, but the world. I don't think this show has the best action, but Miracle Tunes can do drama wonderfully. When the girls start crying, I start crying! Miracle Tunes is not a perfect show, and it's not even my favorite season of the Girls Heroine series, but it is such a great start that embodies what this franchise seeks to be. Magical, heartwarming, and a reminder to fight for the people and things you cherish most. Miracle Tunes does so many things right. It's a sweet little show with fun visuals, endearing characters, and catchy music. Kira Tune and Catch Me stay in my head rent free. The series ends with the girls saving the world of music, losing their powers, and starting their journey as an idol group that doesn't have to save people every week. Again, this is such a great start to the franchise, and I hope things get even better from here. The second season of the girls' heroine series is titled Magi Majo Pures. This season has four lead writers instead of three. Hisako Fujihira, Kanamatsui, and Maoyoki have all stayed from Miracle Tunes. But Yuya Nakazono joins them and will continue to stick with the girls' heroine franchise. Momoka Aino is your typical middle schooler. Until she meets magical heroines, Rin Shirayuki and Mitsuki Hanamori, who come from the magical world. Yes, that's what they call it. 
Anyway, this encounter leads to Momoka discovering an eerie jewelry store where she is gifted the Majoka Porte, the transformation device of this season. After taking this magical compact from a stranger, Momoka goes to watch her friend dance. But oh no! The Jamma Jamma Dan are here to tell everyone their dreams are useless! Does this trio control my inner dialogue too? Oh my gosh! Everyone is affected by this evil magic, except for Momoka, Rin, and Mitsuki. Our two Majimajo peers are struggling in this fight. So Momoka transforms for the first time and helps the girls restore everyone's dreams. This is extraordinary, because a human has never been able to use magic before. From here, Momoka starts taking magic lessons so she can protect everyone's dreams and becomes close friends with the intellectual manga-loving Rin and the athletic happy-go-lucky Mitsuki. Also, there's a magic cat named Mokonyan. She's the mascot of the season and is so cute! The first eight episodes help us get used to the characters, and we even get a cameo from Miracle Miracle! This is the last time we see the majority of the first season's main cast, and that makes me so sad. Canon, sweet child, I miss you! Anyway, we get our first big character arc starting with episode 9, when Shiori is introduced. She works for the same boss as the Jamma Jamma Dan trio. Mitsuki is on her own solo adventure when she first runs into Shiori. However, she becomes more aware of the Maji Majo Pures when Momoka uses her magic to make class a bit more fun in the following episode. From here, Momoka slowly wins Shiori over with her kindness, and even gives her a friendship bracelet. I want one. It's through Momoka's friendship that Shiori realizes who she truly is, and joins our favorite magical team. After the Maji Majo peers become a team of four, we get more solo episodes and more spotlight on the relationship between Momoka and Masahiko. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention him. So, in the show, there are three main villains that have their time to boss around the secondary villains. But first is Jama Danshaku, ruler of the nuisance world. He's an odd man who doesn't seem very capable in the beginning. So his son, Jamahiko, makes a plan to take over his father's position. It's kind of unsettling how easily this dude gets rid of his dad. Jamahiko. Kito. He disguises himself as Masahiko and attends the same school as our leads. He slowly but surely grows close to Momoka, but what he doesn't count on is Shiori joining the good side and how powerful Momoka truly is. Meanwhile, the fifth heroine joins the group. Her name is Yuria. And, and I, I hated her. her. At first. She walks in and is like, hmm, Momoka ain't it. She's not worthy. She's cancelled. Very rude, but power-wise, she does have a point. Yuria is extremely powerful. She could beat Goku. She could have stopped Thanos. Yuria could end all wars. She's an icon. But despite her magical strength, Yuria is lacking in emotion. That's where she and Momoka have to learn from each other. In episode 28, Masahiko's true intentions have been revealed, and the girls want to banish him from the human world. Momoka, however, is the only one who believes he can still be puralized. どうして攻撃が解けたの私、
分かってるでも私私はマサヒコ先輩を助けたいえ,え私たちの力でピュアライズして本当の姿に戻してあげたいモモカ邪魔人は諦めましてとは違う彼は邪魔界の貴公子ピュアライズすること絶対にできない私はそうは思わないえ私生まれてきたどんな人だって夢を持ってるって信じたいんだ魔法戦士はみんなの夢を守るんだよね私は雅彦先輩に夢を守りたいそれができれば素敵だよねうん私も桃花に賛成私もですみんな Momoka is the embodiment of I can fix you. Oh no! Him. I can fix him! <laughs> Normally, I'd say this dynamic is toxic and this might not be the best thing to teach kids, but it does also teach that people can change with your positive influence. We can make the world a better place by believing in our own dreams and encouraging others to chase theirs. That's what I'm choosing to take away from this, as these girls are too young to be in relationships, in my opinion. Yikes! How old is this guy, anyway? After Masahiko is puralized and Yuria gains confidence in Momoka's abilities, we're introduced to the third villain, Masahiko's grandma, Grand Demon. This lady is unhinged, and I think she could have won. But in the Christmas episode, she ends up shacking up with Santa? Oh my god. I wish I was joking! Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. The girls are singing Christmas carols to orphans, and the Jamma Jamma Dan are like, nah -uh. no Christmas cheer for the children. But the kids and the Maji Majo peers are too powerful, and their love of the holidays puralizes Grandma, and she's a little too happy to see Santa, if you know what I mean. After the Christmas episode, the plot kicks into maximum overdrive, and we get reveal after reveal. Momoka's mom used to be a magical warrior who sacrificed her life in the magical realm to be with Momoka's dad. Momoka herself is the Majoka princess, destined to save both magic and human worlds. Yuria, Rin, and Mitsuki all work towards their personal dreams of dancing, making manga, and finding a dream of her own. But the best part of these final episodes is the redemption of the villains. One by one, the Jamma Jamma Dan reveal their true passions, and one of the girls helps them leave evil behind to pursue their dreams. Episode 45 is my favorite. The hopeless Noju has such a sweet dream. Literally. <laughs> After the Jamma Jamma Dan have been defeated, Momoka prepares for the Majoka ceremony. However, she doesn't feel ready yet, especially because once she leaves, she can never return to the human world. For the greater good, Momoka has to leave her loved ones behind. That would be hard for anyone. But Momoka puts on a brave face and the girls travel to the magical world. This leads to an epic battle with <gasps> Jamma Danshaku, now known as Jamma Taite. Tite? Taite? What? Now known as Jamma Taite. He's back and more powerful than ever. Talking simply cannot do this justice. One by one, the girls are tested, and it's their strong friendship with Momoka that helps them succeed. Even Jamahiko comes to help. But unlike the other villains, Jama Taite doesn't immediately get redeemed. It's a nice change of pace. The girls celebrate their victory, 
Momoka becomes a magical princess, and she Hannah Montana's her way out of leaving her human life behind. The final episode ends with the entire cast dancing to the first opening, and the Magi Majo peers casting one last spell for us. I may have cried while watching this. Magi Majo Piers took everything I loved about Miracle Tunes and made it better. I love the focus on magic, friendship, love, and dreams. The character drama feels earned, but it can still be silly when needed. The sets, clothes, and weapons are so fun. There isn't a single thing I would change about Magi Majo Piers. I'm obsessed, and I'll be surprised if a later season can surpass this. Season 3 is titled Phantom Mirage. Once again, this one was directed by Takashi Miike, and the head writer is Yochi Kato, who also worked on Aikatsu, Yokai Watch, and will later return for La Patarina. Other staff includes returning writers Mao Aoki, Kanamatsui, and Yuya Nakazono. This is the first season to only have four core members instead of five, something future seasons would keep as well, and I think I like this better because five can feel a bit crowded, and sometimes certain main characters don't get as much attention as others. Or sometimes, or sometimes two of the girls feel like, like one entity, entity. please don't, don't do that again. again. The production for this one is also interesting because the show was popular enough to get an extended run, as well as a movie. But I'll talk about that later on. Now, let's see what this show is about. Phantom Mirage stars yet another bubbly pink lead named Kokomi, aka Phantomy Heart. After school, she's usually at her dad's bakery with her best friend Saki, who is Phantomy Spade. They spend episodes being a duo, which gives us time to get to know the two and some of the people around them. I will say after more heroines are introduced, Saki gets the least amount of development, making her the most bland in my opinion. She's not a bad character, I think she's adorable, but out of the main four and some later side characters, She's my least favorite. After some fun duo stories, we are introduced to our third lead, Yotsuba, aka Phantomy Clover. She has a strong desire to protect her younger sister because her mom works all the time and her dad is dead. Oh. She also has the worst wig I've ever seen. Good lord, who approved this? This was done so she could have a cool hair transformation when she becomes a Phantomy but I don't think it was worth the cost of this. Anyway, sweet character, good motivation, bad wig. Next! Our last Phantomy doesn't officially join the team for a few episodes after being introduced because she doesn't see the other girls as worthy. Hmm, where have I seen just this like before? You. I think that's true. You're just like me. Yes, I can see. We take responsibility. Luckily, she's not a carbon copy of Yuria. Thank you, thank you. Instead, she hates the idea of teamwork because none of her ancestors, who were also top thieves, had a team. She soon comes to realize that her father, who used to be the best thief around, wouldn't have eventually failed if he found someone to rely on, and with that, Phantomy Diamond is introduced as the final member of the group. Side note, I really like the moral here, that you can't always be successful by yourself. It's okay to make friends and work with people from time to time, to get the best outcome. All of the introductions happen early on in the show's run, so from this point we have some fun solo and team strengthening episodes that really showcase not only the strengths of our main characters, but the main villains too. With the exception of the big bad, but we'll get there when we get there. The three main villains that are focused on at this point in the series are Detective Abe Kobe, Officer Magyaku, who is my favorite of the three, and Chief Gianne. God, I hope I'm saying that right. Anyway, during summer break, there's also a fourth member of the group named Chief Summer. 
who helps the group advance further with their plan for evil or whatever. Also, I love that their whole thing is reverse. Their base is upside down and they go after people who are super popular or accomplished and turn them into the opposite of that. Kind of. That is such a cool concept. By this point, we are at episode 22, which is a recap. I think this show has too many recaps, but I'll give my theory as to why later on. After that, we are introduced to our next big villain, Sarai. Yes, this gets confusing. She's introduced as the daughter of the big bad Sakasama, who is slowly becoming more relevant. And she is so OP compared to the other villains, despite being a child. Or so we think, I'll get there later. She has a dance battle with the girls, and it gets pretty intense. She attempts to reveal the identities of the Phantomy, and causes other problems in order to please her dad. Kokomi slowly grows close to the little girl, despite her slightly annoying nature. It's then revealed that Sarai is not a human girl, and is instead a doll who was abandoned by her owner. Sakasama lied about being her biological father in order to use her for evil, and he never loved her! This sends Sarai into a spiral, and it's a little heartbreaking to watch. But soon she is convinced that she can live as a real girl, and leaves the reverse police. She even meets her old owner later in the season, and it's such a touching episode. Sarai has the best arc from this franchise so far, and I can't do it justice by talking about it. I would highly recommend experiencing this arc in particular, even if you don't want to watch the whole show. It's that good! Sarai does become a recurring character throughout the rest of the show, and even helps the girls out because she's allowed to know their identity. Cool! Also, did I mention that they turn into popcorn if their identities oh, are revealed? No. What? That's so stupid, who came up with that? We do get some more solo episodes after this, including one where Saki is transported into a cartoon world, and the other girls have to enter said cartoon world to save her. They become little chibi caricatures, but I think this was a missed opportunity to do something a little more... Precure-ish? Sailor Moon, maybe? I don't know, I think it would have been cool since they're already magical girls. I want to see anime versions of their transformations. That would have been so cool! Also, during this time, the girls start a dance club? Because they're idols in the real world and the show forgot that, I guess? The show gets a bit scattered until the final few episodes, which normally would have bothered me. And, and the, the unnecessary, unnecessary recap, recap episodes, episodes did. did. But I can forgive the show because of two things. The extended run, which was announced on November 17th, 2019, despite the show only being 33 episodes in at that point, and the global pandemic that hit a few months after that. I'm guessing they had to film some extra material to hit that new 64 episode goal instead of the usual 51. So they had to do some more filming and to save money or time or whatever, they made a handful of recap episodes. Just my theory, I can't confirm this but it doesn't seem like the extended run was a planned thing. Now let's talk about the final few episodes. Remember how the Phantomy will turn into popcorn if their identity is revealed? Well, this happens to Saki, and it's a very stupid conflict. I'll give the team who worked on the show credit. It was a bold move to keep this going for a couple episodes, but once again, it was dumb. During this time of popcorn trouble, we learn about a yellow Phantomy who is older than our heroines. Her name is Amigo. I wish I was joking. And she too was turned into popcorn. The Phantomy Queen helps the girls out with that conflict and also helps them reform one of the reverse villains. Something that will continue to be done one by one, starting with Officer Magyaku, who becomes an actor! Look at him! Look how happy he is! In the following episode, the Chief becomes a model. Slay! and the detective goes into fashion. Sakasama becomes furious with his minions following their dreams, and takes matters into his own hands. This doesn't last long, and he too is redeemed, with a karaoke session with the Phantomy. What? 
After that, we get a dragged out goodbye, once again recapping parts of the show from the girls' point of view. By the end of the show, the girls are still phantomy despite there being no threat. And we get a super cute ending scene where the girls are watching the trailer for La Paterina. I hope this series continues to do baton passes like Precure, but we'll see. Before I can talk about the next season, I need to talk about the Phantom Mirage movie. Phantom Mirage movie version We've Become a Movie is the first film in the Girls Heroine series. Despite taking place during episode 53, the movie didn't air until July 23rd, 2020, nearly a month after the series concluded. It was originally supposed to be released on May 1st, but... Pandemic. Keeping that in mind, this movie is weird. The introduction is a catchy song followed by a fight with a twerking man and his minions? They're not throwing it back like it's at a club, but like they don't know how to do it, and it's a little disturbing. After that, the girls meet a guy who wants to make a phantomy movie. A film within a film type energy, the reverse police want in, Sakasama says no, and instead they mess up the production. There's more sing-alongs as well, with awkwardly inserted bubbles featuring the girls not on screen. And yeah, that's the movie! It's boring and kind of weird. However, I do like the end credits that are a mix of behind-the-scenes footage and clips from the show. It's such a sweet montage that made me already miss these characters. This alone almost redeemed the movie for me, but I can't say the film is good. It's too outlandish for me. Next segment! Takaratomi. Guess who lost her unboxing footage? Yay, me! I made this segment like four months ago. <laughs> and now I am recording this the week before I plan to release this video. So, um, I hope that works out. <laughs> However, this does give me a chance to go over these items again. I'm more experienced with what I'm working with now, so hopefully I can give better detail. Starting with Miracle Tunes, I just have two items because this is the most expensive series to collect out of all of them. Miracle Tunes is so hard to find and I'm lucky just to have this. This, the Miracle Tact was a dream item for me and I'm so happy to have it. So this fluffy little guy here, he doesn't do much. He's just here to be cute and soft. And I really like him. So he's gonna sit here. The Miracle Tact on the other hand has two different modes. Let's take out the jewel. And the first mode is like a basic attack mode. So you just put this in. You can just... Oh. Oh. <laughs> so that's fun. You can just have a little make-believe I am a warrior moment. And the second mode is my favorite. Let me take this out. Let me try that again. <laughs> And the fun thing about this one is that if you stop moving, the song stops. See? Catch me, catch me, so come right to kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, emotional. Thank you. I did theater. But that's all that does. Really, it's it's cute, it's basic. I love her. Next, debatably my biggest collection is my Magi Majo Pures items. First of all, uh, rep the Momoka bracelet. This came with a giant order I got. And it's really cute. <laughs> I love the beads. 
By the way, at the time I am recording this, I have tickets to the Taylor Swift movie, the concert movie, and I hope people give out friendship bracelets because that seemed so magical. I couldn't get tickets to the concert. I was really bummed about it. Not that I had friends that would go with me anyway, but you know. <laughs> I think friendship bracelets are so cute. I'm so glad we're bringing that back. Girlies, we need friendship bracelets all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh. If I ever got to the level where I could go to conventions and like host panels, um, I would want friendship bracelets given out to everybody, but that's just me. Starting with my least favorite item, the compact. This thing is such a pain in the butt to use. I've only gotten it to work like twice. Also, it's really quiet, but there's the pink jewel. I have so many of these jewel things, it's not even funny. Do that. You're supposed to do something. Well, you did something. I have no idea what it's doing. So that's... A, this is B, it's a game mode, I have no idea what that did. Makes pretty colors though. Also, the item itself is very pretty. Just, um, because of the language barrier, uh, it's a little hard for me to use. Whoops. There's a plane? Come on! Sorry for the plane. If you can hear that, hopefully you can't. Or hopefully you can, otherwise I look like an idiot. The first one. This one is fun. You just take the little thing. And it'll respond based on which one you tap against it. Like right now it's playing the transformation music where they're dancing and that's so cute. Or we can try this one. I'll cast that spell. The transformation ones are the most fun, but let's try this purple one. And then you cast the spell. Isn't that cute? The second mode is a game mode. I have no idea what the game modes are ever supposed to do half the time, but like every magical girl item that I have has a game mode. I did something. <laughs> Lucky item. Thank you for that. <laughs> Anyways, that's a really fun item. And you can switch out this part. However you do that. There's like two side parts that go on here. 
There we go. There's also one for a uh, purple girl. I'm forgetting her name at the moment. But yeah, there's one for her as well. But Yuria has her own wand and it's literally the coolest thing I think I own. Just like, wait for it. Look at that! And it's motion controlled, so you can choose like different. You have to press a button first, my bad. But doesn't that look cool? Oh my gosh! So there's like different modes here. You can see Yuria right there. Choose this one. That didn't do it. Maybe it did. No, it did not. Yes, it did. The controls on this are a little confusing, honestly, but it's really cool. Like, very cool. Oh, there's a villain! Whoa! Did we, did we get it? There's like a little villain guy on screen. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, I did that. We can go through the different heart, whatever. I don't remember what the pendant things are called at this moment, but I probably will at like 2 a.m. But you can just choose a random one and then it'll pop up. Hello. Oh, there's a music mode too. Yeah, there's like a whole rhythm game in this. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna have to like get better footage of this. But yeah, there's a lot to this one and I'll just show some footage on screen but it's really cool and it's not gonna shut up for a minute because it has no off button so we'll wait for her to just chillax until then we have another very cool item which is the lantern i think i have the volume off on this so now would be a great time to check my footage volume is on look at her Mokunyan, absolute cutie, adorable. There is so much you can do on this, it's not even funny. Bye bye, matinee. See, that's how she signs off, isn't that cute? The pink mode is my favorite because you can like go to the characters' rooms and decorate them and then hang out and it's just really cute. You can dress them up. Redecorate their room with different themes. Have a conversation, which would be better if I understood what she was saying. Hello, Momoka. I don't know what to ask you. And then she can go visit people. Let's have her visit Yuria. Also, I love how their chibi characters, their hair doesn't fully match what they have in the show. Let's see, they're having a party! Isn't that cute? Oh my gosh. So cute. There's just a lot to this one as well, so I'm gonna let some footage play. Shh. I'm gonna turn you off now. Cause this is another one that doesn't have an off button. So yeah, this one's very cool. Probably my favorite item in this selection. Although Yuria's wand is a close second, followed by the Miracle Tact. But now let's move on to my Phantom Mirage items. As you can see, I have the giant bear. I don't remember your name, hun. I am so sorry. But I also have the Phantomy Risty, I believe that's what it's called. Which, 
It gives Ben 10 watch vibes, honestly. It's so bulky. I do not like magical girl watches. <laughs> or just like toy watches in general. They hurt my arm. Like, ugh. They're so bulky and they go against my bone and just is not a good time. However, still very cute. Can I? <laughs> I put this on the wrong way for you guys, but it's the right way for me. Let's turn this sucker on. There's a game mode, but more importantly, there's a transformation mode. And what you do is you take one of these rings, you put it right there. You just kind of mess with this. You can also put one of the keys in there as like a power up, I believe. I'll just do that. Very cute, however, very bulky and probably my least favorite, even though I do like the colors. It's very cute. Pink and white is such a vibe. Now let's prepare for my last item. Is this thing still on? It is. <laughs> now prepare for the greatest item of all time. I have a gun. So these are two separate items. This is the phantomy time, and then this is like the gun part. <laughs> but what you do, you take this key out. There's a game mode and then a basic mode, like all the items. And what you do is you attach it to this. And I think you put the key in. Or were you supposed to put the key in before? This goes on forever! And that's what you do with that. It's a bit of a pain to get it to work, but once you get it to work, it is so much fun. Anyway, was that pointless? Yes, but does it make me happy? Yes. Um, quality item. Favorite because of goofiness, but not favorite because of quality, you know? Like how many, how many of you can say you have a magical girl gun? Because I can. <laughs> anyway, that is the second attempt I've made at making this item segment. Little chaotic, little messy, but hopefully you guys get the picture and hopefully this was fun. Next segment. They really said, what if we take the Goofy of last season and turn it up to 11? Love Patarina is the fourth season of the Girls Heroine series. The same staff are present and it makes a lot of sense as to why they stayed. Out of every season so far, Love Pat has the most callbacks and references to previous seasons. Even one of our four leads is from another season. Our pink lead of the season is named Tsubasa Aiba. She's an optimistic girl full of love which is kind of a big theme of Love Pat, when she meets this slightly terrifying rabbit named Love Pyoko, she gets the opportunity to become the first Love Pat and fights to protect the love of those she holds dear and defeat the Waru Pyoko troop. As mentioned before, Sarai makes a comeback and becomes Love Pat Purple. She's the most positive in the group and she has catchphrases that are callbacks to the previous season. 
However, with her character development being... well... done? She doesn't have much to do here other than make friends of her own. Not really a complaint though, because I adore her. Our third love pet is named Kohana. She's your typical smart blue character, but she loves gardening thanks to her grandma's influence. Again, she's pretty basic, but a nice addition to the team. Lastly, we have Sora. She's by far the most interesting as she doesn't become a love pet right away. Instead, after discovering their secret, she joins the team and helps his mission control in the coolest layer ever? These sets keep getting cuter and cuter! Anyway, Sora's character arc is her learning not to let her shyness hold her back, and she is inspired by the Love Pat team to become one herself. By far the best character introduction in this season, Love Pat Shine is precious. As you can already tell, the main themes of this season are love and police officers. Already an interesting twist to the more magical or eye-catching careers thus far, but on top of that, each girl has her own separate theme. Tsubasa has animals, Sarai has food, Kohana has flowers, and Sora has weather. Honestly, I think this season has a very cute aesthetic. Probably my favorite so far. The costumes are cute, the sets are even cuter, and their heroine items are really fun. Love, 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 love. After all the members of Love Pat are discovered, we get some of the most annoying episodes I've had the displeasure of watching. This is Satan. Yes, that is their real name. Satan is canon in the girls' heroine universe. I am the devil from the Bible. And she hatched from an evil egg, and Subasa spends her time being nice to Satan because that's her thing. Which I understand, but I did not enjoy these episodes at all. One thing I will say I appreciate is that unlike the previous seasons, the Love Pats don't keep their identity a secret. Once they're discovered, the girls just accept their fate and embrace their public popularity. It's a nice change of pace from turning, turning into, into popcorn, popcorn and being, being eaten alive. After the Satan episodes, the show becomes a bit forgettable in my opinion. I think the writers thought this too, because all of the previous heroines, who were available, show up and the rest of the series becomes a big early celebration for the 5th anniversary, as each of the Love Pack girls has to find the treasure of the previous teams. Sora finds a Miracle Tunes microphone, which is just a mic with a sticker slapped on it. Kohana finds that magic orb we see in the Maji Majo Pures intro. Sarai finds... fans? Honestly, I'm not mad, that's on brand. And Tsubasa decides that the Love Pat treasure is a notebook that contains all of their precious memories. Very cute. What happens after they find these treasures? Buckle up because this ending is rushed. So their director, Lovey G? Love G? Love G? So the director is like, hey girls, I miss my parents, so Tsubasa's in charge! And the girls throw him a party? We then get a scene similar to the Precure Baton Pass, where the Love Pats introduce us to the heroines of the next season. That's it. That's how it ends. I can't find any numbers to suggest this, but between this show premiering in the cursed year 2020, and possibly toys not selling well, I think Love Pat was cancelled early. It's the shortest season so far, with only 48 episodes compared to the usual 51 or... 64 that Phantom Mirage had for some reason. That's speculation on my part. Don't quote me on that. But it feels like the team behind Love Pat wasn't confident in the series, as there are a lot of callbacks to previous seasons. Even in the movie! So take everything negative I said about the Love Pat series, and add toilet humor and rabbit tits. I, I never, never thought, thought I'd say, say those, those last two words, words back, back to back. Anyway, our leads get a mysterious call and are arrested. <gasps> but it turns out they did nothing wrong and instead are requested to protect this love stone that vaguely reminds me of Kurudun. The first part of this movie is pretty normal. It's half plot and half dance numbers from the show. 
things get weird when the guy who arrested the girls ends up getting attacked by the villains and is turned into a thief. A standard fight ensues until we get to this helicopter scene. You'd think he would escape and the love pats would have to chase him down. But no! This man takes off his socks and the smell leaves our heroine. <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> and the smell leaves our heroines unable to attack. Um, gross. But is that all it takes to stop these girls? Because that's sad. Luckily, the Phantomy girls come to help. Again, shenanigans ensue involving disguises, dancing, and... Shit. Sparkly. Shit. <laughs> Why does it bounce? <laughs> After even more cameos and... Rabbit birth? Sarai, so never speak again. The movie ends. I never want to watch this again. It's the fifth anniversary and we've got not only a new season, but a new logo. Very cute. Kirameki Powers has the coolest aesthetic so far, in my opinion. I'm in love with the outfits, the transformations, the, the attacks, attacks that are fun little rhythm, rhythm games. games. Kirameki Powers feels like a magical girl RPG, and I'm living for it. Our pink leader for this season is named Kirari. She's a bubbly girl who loves dancing and playing video games. She's the first to meet Himinyan, who is actually the princess? <laughs> Ariana, what are you doing here? <laughs> From the game Kirari is playing? Cool! Anyway, it's up to Kirari to protect Himinyan as Kira Power Seni and find a way to turn her back into a human and save the world of Kiramori from the Witch, Witch of Darkness! Ooh. Of course, with every sun, there has to be a moon. Yuzuki is a kind hearted girl whose goal in life is to help others. After witnessing one of Kira Power Seni's battles, Yuzuki becomes inspired by Kirari's strength and becomes Kira Power Moon. Moon Prism Power Mega! From here we get the usual Monster of the Week plots and a cameo from the Love Pat team. It's not until the girls search for the Metamore memory that the story starts to pick up. The girls finally face a foe that is too powerful for them. As they are about to be defeated, two newer animal characters turn into the remaining Kira Powers. The bird becomes Kira Power Fine and the hamster becomes Kira Power Snow. They defeat the Dark Knight and continue on their quest to make Himinyan human again. Then the girls spend some time powering up, but oh no! Honika has been kidnapped after disguising herself as the princess, and the remaining three heroines have to save their partner. This conflict only lasts three episodes, but it's well done and gives the viewers more insight about the villains in this season. Good job, writers! Episode 20 is a recap, then the girls have to fight one of the redeemed villains, who has been turned evil again. The girls are instructed by Love Pat Purple to receive the powers of previous heroines, and a new villain named Claris is introduced. Now, now where have I, I seen, seen this, this before? before? Like Love Pat, Kirameki Powers has dedicated episodes to highlighting the previous seasons, but here the pacing is a lot better. Each girl is given one episode to spend with one of the heroines from a previous team, and a follow-up episode to use the new power-up in a regular battle. I really enjoyed this, and my favorite of these episodes was Kira Power's Snow Story with Fuka from Miracle Tunes. I loved this episode in particular because Koyuki learns to appreciate what talent she brings to her team. And the writers finally let Fuka do her own thing as a solo artist. I am so tired of seeing the same Miracle Tunes PNGs for these reunions. It's so forced. I love Miracle Tunes, I I've said it. I, I love, love Miracle, Miracle Tunes, Tunes, but it's so obvious that there's only one member that stayed. It's awkward seeing promo images from years ago being used like they're current, especially when Fuka is more mature now. Anyway, during this Back to the Past adventure, Claris kidnaps Himinyan. However, she later gives her back, 
but has cast a spell that is turning the princess into a real cat. Not only are the power-ups important for saving Himinyan, but also Claris. A big theme of this season besides video games is friendship. Throughout the show, each person saved becomes a Bitomo, which is a friend who helps assist the girls in battle. Claris is very similar to Sarai from Phantom Mirage, but instead of being an abandoned doll, Claris has only known isolation. She wants friends more than anything, and is afraid of being left alone. Kirari assures Claris that the Kirameki powers will be her friends, and she'll never be forgotten or isolated again. It's a basic villain redemption story, but Kirameki Powers tells it well. Claris is a wonderful character, however her story isn't quite done yet. The Witch of Darkness isn't going to let Claris go that easily, and locks her away for the Kirameki Powers to find. This proves to be quite difficult, and Claris eventually starts to lose hope, once again turning evil. This should be an exciting story. We want to see Claris reunite with the girls. We want to see the Kirameki powers defeat the Witch of Darkness, but something stops the final episodes of the series from being great. Starting with episode 39, the runtime has been cut in half, with only 13 minutes per episode including the opening, ending, and sometimes transformations, meaning there's only a few minutes of original content each episode. As you can imagine, this is quite infuriating for someone who is trying to binge the show, the reason this was done was to make room for the next Mikkei production, Rista Stars. Both of these shows shared a block together until Kirameki Powers ended, and Rista was allowed to have a longer episode time. However, I think this majorly hurt Kirameki Powers' pacing. With the shortened episode time, the story has a harder time progressing. Each time you feel like you're getting somewhere, the ending theme plays and you have to continue to the next episode, where you'll only get a few minutes of new content, as each episode has to play the introduction, opening theme, and ending theme. I'm estimating here, but that has to be at least 6 or 7 minutes out of a 13 minute runtime. That's abysmal and greatly hurts the show. You get even less new content if the transformations or attacks are used too, so cutting the runtime in half was definitely a bad move. Regardless, the girls redeem Claris, discover why the game came to life, redeem the Witch of Darkness, restore the Kira Power Kingdom, and return Himinyan to her princess form. The last episode has a fun dance sequence with the cast like Maji Majo Pures did, which made me smile. But I can't overlook the pacing issues at the end. This could have been one of my favorite seasons, as the characters are likable, the visuals are impressive, the music is great, and the story had a lot of potential. It's not a bad show, but it could have been better. Welcome to part two of the item segment. Yay! This one won't be as long because I have less items and I was sick yesterday, so I don't feel like being on camera that long. So let's jump in. So first we have the Love Pat Shuffle, which comes with the Love Pat Shuffle. Some cards. And this cute little badge that we can put on. Let me make it a mirror and do this. <laughs> wow, I'm a Love Pat. <laughs> I may be cringe, but I am free. So like the previous items I've reviewed in the other section, this has an A mode and a B mode, which is basically transformation, roleplay mode, and a game mode. So let's switch that on to A. And all you have to do is press the top button, this slides out. And you can choose from a variety of cards. I'm gonna go with Love Pat Purple. She's my favorite out of this group. And we are gonna do her transformation card. I don't like how you have to kind of bend them to slide them in though. That like stresses me out. I don't like to bend cards. <laughs> but you do this. This is 
is all you do. You just level, 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 level. Do that. And that's all there really is to this one. And the song is actually very long. But I can't play it all here because copyright. Now for game mode, we'll choose a different card. I don't know. Anyways, um, shove a blue card in there. Yeah, the different cards do different things. Honestly, I don't really care about the game modes on these. I'm more about display and using the transformation modes. I think that is the heart of these items. That's what I appreciate about them. That's what I'm here for. So I think the Love Pat Shuffle succeeds and I think it is very cute. I love the little like stars on the side. That is so adorable. And this color purple is just, it speaks to my soul, you know? So now that we've covered the one Love Pat item I have, let's switch over to the game segment. It's time for a game review. Police heroine Love Paterina, Love Na Rhythm Day Taiho Shimasu is a rhythm minigame collection for the Nintendo Switch that was released on November 26, 2020. As you play the main story, you unlock the other love pads and collectible cards. There are a variety of different difficulty levels, which is a nice touch, but the minigames feel very mobile, like this was meant for iPads. I guess that fits with the target demographic, but honestly, a Kirameki Powers game would have hit so much harder. This is a cute time waster though. Welcome back, let's move on to the Kira Power items. Now for this one, I'm just gonna have to play a reference video because it's huge and I can't really use it here. I mean, I kinda can, but I'm trying not to hit myself or anything around me. So most of this will just be a voiceover session. So obviously you can switch between these two. Kira Sunny and Kira whatever Moon. Kira Power Moon. What is her name? <laughs> what is her name? <laughs> I don't remember her name. Fake fan. Anyway, you can switch these out between pink and purple. And then when you turn it on, you can either play a game mode or you can attack and transform or whatever the heck they do. And lastly, we have the Kira Power Phone and this little cartridge that came with it that you can scan with the camera. But there are four different modes. You can have like the regular transformation. Is that what this is? Yes, it is. Where you have to like scan I'm trying to get to where y'all can see it. And just snow. Then you just swipe. And then it plays your little transformation thing, but like. Also, they changed the key of the song. Like in her normal transformation in the show, it's a little higher pitched. Either I'm going crazy or something. Here it's normal, but it's that start that sounds off to me. Isn't she adorable? She's so cute! That was cute! And then there are three different game modes. You have to help somebody. Now your friends! I love that this actually operates like a smartphone kind of, where you touch that's adorable. <laughs> Evidently I didn't choose something right, but that's okay. She said... <gasps> you can accessorize her?! <gasps> she can have a little crown! <gasps> oh! 
Ugh, I needed to play around with this more before I did anything. And now I'm on a screen I do not recognize. There's a ton here, oh my gosh. I actually need to use the items before I film these. Let's be real, I've used this like twice. Anyways, there is also a picture mode where you can like, you know, use the back camera to take a picture of something around you. And you can put stickers, I believe. And that's really it. Really, I have not been disappointed with really any of the items except for maybe the Phantomy wrist just because it feels like a very clunky Ben 10 watch and that's not really my vibe. But overall, these have been really good. And I hope you guys have enjoyed these segments. I love doing item segments. I think these are so fun. And I'm totally not ripping off other YouTubers. Definitely not. Anyway, let's get back to the video. At this point, Girls Girls or Girls Squared has become an established idol group thanks to the success of the Girls Heroine series, but the girls are getting older and the franchise is on hiatus. So what's left to do? A lot apparently, as the idol group made documentaries, a live action drama, and a two season anime series with a corresponding manga. Starting with what caught my attention first, Girls Garden or Garugaku is an animated series of three minute shorts about a school for idols known as St. Girls Square Academy or Garugaku for short. Every student who attends this academy dreams of performing at the girls' arena, which is the entryway to becoming a professional idol. However, competition is stiff, as there can only be one team out of the entire academy that can stand on the stage. These shorts are cute and there's a lot of fun music included throughout the 50 episodes, so this is a real treat for fans. Also, I really love that the group sometimes splits into smaller groups, so we have more of an opportunity to enjoy the girls' individual voices. South Square, congratulations, will stay in my head, rent-free. After the first season of the anime ended, a drama of the same name began airing and continued the story. Spoilers! Spoilers. Girls Square performed at the girls' arena and have now split into three groups to continue training as East Squared, West Squared, and South Squared. After being assigned one final project that will determine whether they graduate or not, the girls reunite and begin promoting the fun trends of Harajuku. Unlike the anime, the drama has a normal runtime of just under 24 minutes, which I don't know if I prefer because I got used to the fast pace of the shorts, but this is still a cute show and it was fun seeing the girls acting again. Fast forward to 2022, a sequel to the anime was made with the same exact 3 minute format, only this time it stars the younger group Lucky Lucky or Lucky Squared. I hate that they can go by multiple names. This is just as enjoyable as the first season, and I'm happy the younger of the two groups is getting the same treatment, as both groups have a lot of talent. Before I move on to Rista, I do want to mention the documentaries Miracle of Nine and Revolution 1 and 2, which gives fans more insight into all the work that goes into their performances. I'd only recommend these if you're like a super fan, or if you're interested in idols in general. It really helps you see how hard these girls work, and I admire that. These girls, at least on camera, seem to have a great, almost sisterly bond. I hope no matter what, they'll always have each other. Dancers who make dreams come true. These are the top of artists. So why is this seemingly unrelated series in this video? It might not carry the girl's heroine name, but it's still attached to the franchise by being connected to the official Girls Heroine social media, having the same director as all the previous seasons, and Lucky Lucky providing music, and even appearing in an episode. Instead of being a more traditional tokusatsu like previous seasons, Rista is described as a danceable drama with a focus on dance battles. There are rivals in this series, but no one's really in danger, there's no monsters, there's no world-ending threat. There's just a dance. But that's not necessarily a terrible change, it's just... different. Our story begins with the overly optimistic Miu, who was obsessed with dance. After learning about legendary top artist Ryuji Hoshigami's new Rista stage and corresponding product placements, Miu joins Rista Dance Academy and forms the group Rista Shine with the cold-hearted Rion and the energetic former basketball player Shota. Yes, this is the first season to include boys in the main group. 
I really like this as it proves that anyone can be magical, or a good dancer, but I think the second one has been proven. Anyway, these three trained to perform on the Rista stage, and have to learn to work together and ignore mean girls. I hate these three. Like the later half of Kirameki Powers, Rista begins as an 11 minute show, including the outro song by Lucky Lucky. However, the intro is very short, and there's less time to focus on transformations and typical power-ups, so I don't mind this format. It works better here than it did with the previous season. However, it changes back to the usual 24 minutes at episode 13. The story gets a bit more interesting when the anonymous team interrupts Rista's first performance. A new girl named Hinata arrives. She's a shy girl who is electric on stage. Her confidence in dance greatly contrasts her reserved personality, although she truly wants to become more extroverted. After growing close to the main trio, she gets her own Rista bracelet and confesses she knows the true identity of one of the anonymous members. Ichigo Ren is Hinata's childhood best friend, who was the first to encourage her to dance, but she has no idea why he joined Anonymous. So she decides to dance, because that's how all conflicts must be resolved. It makes sense, I'm not complaining, but this show is extremely repetitive, and if you don't like dance, it's kind of boring. Ren tells Hinata not to dance, contradicting his advice from before, but Hinata gathers the courage to take on Anonymous by herself and loses. Despite her loss, she officially joins Rista, and the four continue to dance their hearts out. It takes some time, but Ren becomes Rista's fifth and final member. Yay! Who would have thought? What a twist! The Anonymous story continues. It seems as if, uh, Ryuji? I forgot who he was for a minute knows the leader of Anonymous, Taiga Tsukishiro. The two used to be partners. <coughs> dance. Partners. But split due to their different views about dancing. <laughs> oh my god, this is so dumb. It's the one partner pursues perfection and power while the other stays true to the art and just wants to have fun dynamic. And while that's not original at all, I'd much rather watch Ryuji and Taiga than whatever the main cast is doing at this point in the show. To my surprise, it doesn't take the entire show for Rista to defeat Anonymous. After episode 25, we get a recap episode before the group announces their debut as Rista Dreams. But oh no! Anonymous is back! But wait, we can see their faces. They're no longer anonymous, and instead are called Disa Star. Like, disaster? Boo! Anyway, after this reveal, the team is finally educated on the origin of Ryuji and Taiga's conflict, and how this all started because Taiga was salty about losing to Ryuji. Performers can be so dramatic. Luckily, learning this new information motivates Rista Dreams even more as they prepare for their debut. But oh no! The Rista site is hacked by Disaster, And despite the crazy visuals, I still don't care. Anyway, Rista debuts and has an audience of those light sticks that you get at idol concerts. I love the visuals of Rista, but this is taking me out. <laughs> like, why do they move like that? Of course, Rista crushes their performance, but Taiga refuses to give up. Episode 31 is our cameo episode from Lucky Lucky, who are called Love Powers here. Very cute reference. And the villain from Maji Majo Pierce is here too! I'm so glad she's still around. This episode made my day. Even if it is somewhat of a recap, the references to previous seasons made it okay. Of course, Rista does win by the end because they know that dancing is supposed to be fun. Yay! And Ryuji and Taiga become dance partners again, which I'm a little more happy about because their dynamic was basic, but well done. Although I am upset that the last episode is mostly recap of just the last few episodes? That was not needed! Such a shame that this is where the girls' heroine franchise has ended. I like the addition of boys to the main cast. The visuals are continuing to improve, 
And of course, the opening and ending themes are good. However, this season felt very basic. Maybe it's just because I don't really like shows that are only focused on performing. The previous seasons had singing and dancing, but they also had cool fights and more interesting character drama in my opinion. That being said, I don't want to end this video on a low note, so let me show you my final ranking of every season, and you can debate amongst yourselves whether I'm right or deserve to die. I love the internet! Bring out the pyramid! At the bottom, Rista Stars! You're not bad, but you're not good either. You're the reason why this video took me so long to make. Next we have Love Pat. You have the cutest aesthetic. You have Sarai. But the overly goofy tone, abrupt ending, and episodes with Satan made me almost hate you. Number 4, Kirameki Powers. You and Phantom Mirage almost switched places. But you fumbled your ending. I really enjoyed the world of this one but cutting the runtime in half really hurt this season. Number three, Miracle Tunes. A great foundation for sure. Likeable characters, the music note wand is iconic, the sets are so fun, but this season is basic compared to future installments. Number two, Phantom Mirage. While it's a bit more silly than I'd like, the tone stays mostly consistent, and Sarai's episodes really made this a stellar season. And at the top of the pyramid, we have Magi Majo Pures! Peak magical girl content. Great characters, costumes, sets, effects, weapons, music. Oh my gosh, I love Magi Majo Pures. This is the season I recommend the most. It's so, so, so charming. So, so cute. I love it. Whether you've seen any of the girls' heroine series or you're totally insane and listen to me ramble for like an hour, I hope you had fun watching this video. Maybe you found a season you'd like to watch or revisit. I think live action series have a bad reputation because of some questionable western adaptations, and I don't think that's fair. The girls' heroine series is just one of many examples of live action series that are pretty good. If you made it to the end, thank you so, so much for watching. This video has been in the works for nearly a year. I really hope it was worth the effort. If you'd like to see more consistent content from me, follow me on TikTok and Instagram. Lastly, troop on hopelets, stay adorkable, bye!